Can I give my Chet Holmgren nitpick? I do like Chet. So, the floor's yours. For somebody who's that tall and that long and seems to have good shot blocking instincts, and I've watched Gonzaga a bunch of times now. People around the basket with him kind of get to the rim. They kind of go at him, and, and his timing on some of those shot blocking isn't awesome. Like, he's if the guy's coming at him, it's fine. But around the rim, the shiftier guys are like the muscle guys. I'm not totally sold on him athletically as a shot blocker around there. And then maybe he'll get better. But so I, I think about that and I think of his physique. And I think he's one of the hardest to peg lottery picks of my lifetime. Wow. I don't, it's a, it's, he's an incredible ceiling basement guy. You could walk me in any scenario and I, and I don't even have a, an opinion yet. The one thing I like about him, I like that he moves and he's busy. And he's not just a dude that's just kind of like plotting or standing there. Like he, he's, he's in awesome the game. The he's ball. doing stuff. Yeah. He's always like his brain's moving. I like that. I just don't know what to make of him. I've never seen a player like him before, so I don't know how to evaluate it. And I know some of the people like Schmitz, KOC, um, Kyle Mann, like they all like him. It's not like anybody's like, this guy's going to be a bust. You know, Bradley, I going way back coming out of BYU. He took two years off, entered the draft. He'd had the one year to look at. Then he was two years older. And it was like, oh, what, is, what is this guy? Is he athletic enough? And I don't think people think Chet's going to be a bust. I, I, I just don't know how to evaluate it yet. So I'm excited to watch him in more games. Yeah, he's really impressive. I think you nailed it, though, on the floor ceiling thing, because I, I think if you argued about like who has the best ceiling out of this class, this is why people argue about him being number one. You know, because he does. He has that. Like, what if it all comes together? What if he fills out a little bit more? I mean, yeah, he gets pushed off of his spot. You know, we're one year out of high school with this kid, and he's really skinny. Uh, I don't love... He is athletic, but I don't... There's just something about the way he's sort of hunched and his gait that's a little weird, but then he'll be really explosive. Like, he'll get going with a little momentum, and he'll do a pivot through the lane, spin, dunk on you, and then run back the other way. I saw him block a shot in the San Francisco game in the tournament, in their conference tournament, where the guy was going to bring it around the other side of the rim, and he was like going up to block it with one hand and then realized the kid adjusted, and he adjusted to the kid and then mm. spiked it in the backboard. And you're like, that's some... There are really good instincts there. You know, like Wiseman was somebody a couple of years ago, one of the things I worried about, even though I liked him as a prospect, I was like, you can see him thinking every step of what he's doing. You can see him thinking the game instead of playing the game. Chet just plays. Yep. So there's a lot of stuff that I really like there, but the problem is you have two absolutely, you know, just physical specimens in the argument with Bancaro and Jabari, where, you know, Chet, a different draft, maybe there isn't a discussion, but we're talking about really special players that have all the size you could ever want in the wing positions that are in the mix. This is my Hall of Fame of hardest players ever to evaluate <laughs> for me personally. Okay. All right. I love this. I never cared about the draft. I that's not true. I always cared about the draft, but I never like had enough of an opinion on the draft until uh, MJ and Bowie, because that was ludicrous when it was happening. But it really was. It was one of those things where it was like, wait, they're not going to take. He, Hakeem was one thing because, you know, you had to take Hakeem had to go first, and it turned out to be the right pick. As crazy as it sounds, but MJ not going second. We don't need to litigate that, but. Sam Bowie was the first really hard guy to evaluate that I can remember because he was good, but he had the stress fractures things. And it was just lingering over the whole thing because the talent was there. And it, but then you would look at his stats and I just, that was the first guy I remember being confused by. So I have him. I have Walter Berry. St. John's. Wow. The truth, the original truth. It's my second favorite college basketball player of all time. 1986, 23 and 11. 56%. And I just thought, all right. And and it was like, no, he's not going to be a top 10 pick. It's like, why? It's like, because it's not big enough. It doesn't translate. It's going to be too hard. What? what? And he just didn't make it. And now but there might have been other stuff going on behind the scenes, but it was the first time I really did. My eyes were telling me he was going to be better, but all the scouts were like, no, not a top 10 pick. And I was just like, wait, am I, what am I? Am I doing this wrong? <laughs> so this guy's not going to come in and score 25 points. So I had a couple more of these. 
Bo Kimball in 1990, who averaged 35 a game for uh, Loyola Marymount. Now, granted, they had the pace. pace, but just like the guy fucking scored 35 a game. He's not going to do that in college. Nope. Chris Jackson, who eventually became Mahmoud Abdul Rauf, was just out of control as a scorer in college. But, you know, he had Tourette's and he, he had if the team wasn't as good as I think people and they, there was like a question like, well, what's this going to look like in the pros? And is he, is he, you're going to have to gear your whole offense around him. And I was like, no, he's going to be awesome. I guess he was kind of semi disappointing as a pro, right? Compared to where we thought he was going to be in college. Cause he averaged 29 a game in college. Think about that. Where do you remember your, your, uh, Chris Jackson takes 30 plus years ago? Yeah. I, I mean, he was, he was appointment viewing for college basketball. Yeah. It just seemed it was, like he seemed yeah. like a lock for the NBA. And then they're like, it's too small. He's a, he he's was, a shoot first point guard. It's not going to yeah. happen. I'm like, no, it'll be fine. So I got him. Sean Bradley, 1993. This was one for me. Isaiah Ryder. 1993. At UNLV in 1993, he averaged 29 points and nine rebounds a game and was a 52, 41, 83 percentages and was super exciting. And at that point, I was watching college hoops and I just thought like, people don't see it. This this guy, he's going to destroy the league. Um, he was just, I think, just had too many personal things going on. But that was a tough one because talent-wise, it was there, right? It was like, this is this is happening. But the other stuff kicked in. Next one is a Donald Foyle, 1997. Here are stats at Colgate. 24 and 13 with 6.3 blocks per game. Remember, it was like, is this guy Bill Russell or is he just in the Patriot League? <laughs> <laughs> like, but what are we watching? <laughs> so I have him. Next one, Marvin Williams, 2005. Now, I was out on Marvin Williams, but I also thought he was hard to evaluate because I was like, if he was good, he would start for UNC. I was in that camp. But then there was the camp of like perfect 3 and D guy. You guys don't see it. He'll be, but I think my camp. His was body right. changed. He, he was yeah, one he of those guys. Ass. He did the Drew Gooden thing where Drew Gooden at Kansas and it was like, oh, well, and Drew Gooden still was a hell of a player there, but it was like you turned into big ass rebound punish you guy instead of like, give me the ball. I'm going to slash through everybody. Yeah. So Marvin, Marvin went in that Drew Gooden direction. Adam Morrison, I think is in the top three hardest person ever to evaluate because he was an awesome scorer in college. I thought he was going to be good in the pros. I kind of still feel like if he goes to a different team and doesn't blow out his knee, there's a world where he's good. But then other people were like, no, nope, he's going to suck. Yeah. And I, it was really hard to figure out. Uh, Greg Oden, 2007. Don't need to litigate that one. Evan Turner, 2011 was really hard because he was like basically 20, 10, and 7 every night. It's like, what is this? Is this going to be something? Evan and Turner then, was a classic, I love this guy. How come people aren't talking him up? Yeah. I can't believe he's outside of the lottery. This is stupid. You guys are fucking stupid. And then it's like, oh, he's going to go two? I'm like, I don't. Like, and then you were almost arguing against yourself. Because for a right. year, I'm watching him play at Ohio State. I'm like, I love this guy's game. He does everything. Like, this is a joke that he's projected outside of the lottery. And then as it caught up, I was like, oh, I don't know if I like him this much. <laughs> yeah, it was It was like kind of like what happened with Westbrook, actually. Westbrook was my favorite sleeper in that draft. And all of a sudden, he was going fourth. And it's like, well, I didn't... I, fourth seems high. Uh, two more. I had uh, Austin Rivers, which just seemed like this guy was the best player Heading into college basketball, freshman year didn't go the quite the way it went, but it still seems like he should, I don't know, have a little more cachet than being like the 10th pick. Dame Lillard's going to go about Dame Lillard is at Weber State. It's going to go ahead. Austin Rivers, who was the number one pick a year, number one recruit a year ago. I That might be in a draft diary archive of mine. It's like, really? really? We're taking yeah. Really? We're taking Dame Lillard over Austin Rivers? What are we doing? Dame was funny because it Tough. was... There was a team that I was talking to that was they felt like they were on him earlier than other teams. It's not like there's going to be any secrets. And they were like, they had a pick, I think, in the mid, middle of the first round. And we're like, we're going to get this guy. We're going to get this guy. And then they're showing up to Weaver State. And now they're like, everybody was on him. They're like, we're not going to get him. He's going to be gone. And he goes sixth. Yeah. Uh, my, la my last guy was Lamella. That's, that's my entire list. 
Yeah, Lamelo was 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 a tough one because it was Australia. It was it wasn't as bad as Giannis. Um, we talked about it on this pod many times. We had no idea what to make of it. The Australia stuff was terrible, and yeah, he the, played the interviews. Like, the right. interviews were were tough. But I we never when we get dragged for that, no one ever mentions that right up until the draft. Though I was like, hey, I'm hearing from teams that have gotten him in now, and they're like, nah, there's some there's some like smarter teams that I trusted. We're like, we're sort of blown away. Like once we had him in here, uh, I think the Giannis one is one of the all timers because there's there's nothing I well there's definitely things I hate more than this, but one of the things I think is entirely unfair to front office and GMs is like oh look at all of these guys that went ahead of Giannis. It's like okay, but did you watch? And that's why I always you know defend my position. Be like, did you watch him? Did you watch any of the Giannis stuff? Because the Giannis stuff was you didn't really know what to do with it. You but he also he grew it. three inches too. He went from six nine to seven feet after the draft. True, but it was the the level of comp that at least I had access to. You were like, okay, like this is ridiculous. Like these guys, they looked like Ben's buddies with pennies on, trying to guard Giannis in a gym where there were no seats on like one side of it. So, and I talked to John Hammond about it. You know, who and I go, what was it? And he was, he, he's always been pretty forthcoming. And in, in, in when you talk to him about stuff, and he goes, he just fit a profile of somebody we thought had a really yeah. high ceiling. It's the middle of the first round, like, you know, kind of like whatever. You know, there's definitely safer bets here, but look at this guy. Maybe he becomes this, maybe a little this, little of that. And now he's, you know, in the conversation of the best basketball player in the world. But that was, that's absurd. It's absurd to think that when you look back at the stuff that you had access to when he's coming out of the draft. I don't even, he doesn't even make my hardest to evaluate list because to me, he was just a really raw, great athlete. Who the fuck knows? Could he be Paul George? I remember that was when, because I did that draft. I, I liked when they took him. I thought it was the right place to take him. It's like, oh, the guy could be Paul George, like a 6'9", small forward who can handle the ball. Nobody, there's no fucking way. So that's my list. I have... Sam Bowie, Walter Berry, Chris Jackson, Bo Kimball, Sean Bradley, Isaiah Ryder, Donald Foyle, Marvin Williams, Adam Morris, and Greg Oden, Evan Turner, Austin Rivers, Lamella Ball, and then new inductee, Chet Holmgren, who I think is in the Mount Rushmore for me, the hardest fucking guy to figure out. You can tell me he's going to be on five All-NBA teams, <laughs> and you can tell me he's going to be like fairly disappointing, and I would believe any version of it. So anyone, anyone that uh, we didn't talk about that you would throw in there? All time? No, just for you. Hard hard to evaluate, guys. Well, that was the Giannis thing. Um, yeah. The Embiid thing was... I mean, Embiid was so clearly the best player in that yeah, class. Yeah, that, was, that wasn't hard. But but when it's a foot, it's a back. Like Part yeah. of the Embiid story that I think is kind of crazy, and granted, there was a little difference, so maybe people don't seem to... But if you play 31 games to start your career in the first three seasons, and then you become an MVP and arguably one of the best in the game, like that's normally you don't get that start to a good story. Right. That's usually, that usually the start to a disappointing story. And for all the bumps and bruises along, like he stayed way healthier than I ever thought he would. But you also understood with somebody that big, sometimes the foreign prospects, uh, the, the teams can get a little spooked sometimes on some of the medical stuff. And, you know, Jabari Parker went ahead of Joel Embiid. And not one person thought Jabari Parker was better than Embiid. <sighs> that was a tough one. I don't. I mean, he hurt his knee again after that draft, too, but he had, he, once he had the double ACL thing. <laughs> 